Dr. Rashad Ritchie is a nationally known political and social commentator and radio host of the Rashad Ritchie Show, morning show based in Atlanta. But now he is expanding his role uh, to include president of Rolling Out Magazine. And he's here to talk about that and some big stories we are following today. Dr. Rashad, it's a pleasure to have you on the air with us. Thank you for starting your day with us. Listen, this is a dream come true. Uh, to be with both of you. I appreciate you sharing, Mike. Thank you so much. No, it's an honor for us to you. have you. Hey, well, congratulations. First and foremost, uh, rolling out uh, should be uh, happy to have you. Uh, you're, you're really uh, an esteemed person, uh, great career, great journalist, uh, great uh, philanthropist. But Rolling Out Magazine is already the largest black owned free print publication uh, in, 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 in America right now. So with you being in charge of it right now, how do you expect to take it to the next level? Let me first say that Munson Steed, our founder, did something remarkable a little more than 20 years ago. Uh, he had the insight and the wisdom to say, we need something out here in, in media land that has a razor sharp focus on the black community. And that's exactly what he did. Uh, he continues to be my CEO uh, and a remarkable man, a remarkable mentor. Uh, here's what we want to do. We want to make sure that uh, our number one status uh, as a Black-owned media publication uh, in America remains intact. But we also want to become a top five mm -hmm. media provider across the entire gamut. And we think we can do that. We think we have the numbers to do so. Um, a recent study came out that showed that 74% of African Americans, they are now in complete favor of media that caters uh, to, their, uh, to their desires, to their um, curiosity uh, to their information platform uh, and we're super serving that community but we're also starting to super serve our political community um, which goes outside of the bubble of race and culture uh, we still stay true to our entertainment roots uh, as well as our culture roots but we now see and we now have more of, a, of an appreciation for how policy impacts the culture all around us and we're going to combine all of those elements uh, and make a big impact here at Rolling Out. I, I want to talk about Roots real quick. I want to follow up because a journalist, and maybe this is just a little personal thing for me because sometimes I'm in the blogs, my wife's in the blogs sometimes, and it's a lot of sensationalism. It, it's a lot of seediness. It's a lot of, you know, non-journalistic type of things that are out there. Uh, it, it, sometimes you need that. You need the entertainment. Don't get me wrong, Dr. 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 Richie, but should there be more responsibility uh, from black media when, when it comes to our community? I think that needs to be more responsibility in media across the board. Um, I'm a live and let live kind of guy, okay? If you write something and it's your opinion, just let people know it's your opinion. Don't represent it as it being fact. Um, we have mm -hmm. many, many, many remarkable journalists who have decided to basically, um, you know, bend over for what's happening in the atmosphere of journalism rather than stand up for what they truly believe. Uh, at Rolling Out, we have a very simple philosophy. Uh, we have our hardline journalists that they call it as they see it. Uh, yes, it does have a black perspective, but the reality is uh, journalism has always had a perspective of sorts, no matter what. What you try to do is make sure that there's not implicit or overt bias in your storytelling. And if mm -hmm. there is bias, well, let's make sure that is classified as an op-ed, that we have opinions, that's fine, and we can have opinions in journalism all day, uh, but we represent it as such if we... Uh, have an op-ed. We do not conflate those lines without making sure the reader is well informed as to the bias or non-bias of the writer. Rashad, um, we love Munson um, and we love you, okay? And more people are mm -hmm. turning to mm -hmm. rolling out mm -hmm. under your leadership than ever before. But mm -hmm. you had me at 74% because, aha, a network was born, BNC. And it's like this sympathetical right. thing we have going on here. Uh, mm -hmm. But I mm -hmm. love that you know something about everything. You have your foot in everything. I want to talk about some of the stories that we've all been closely following. The officers uh, involved in uh, George Floyd's death now facing those federal charges. We know Derek Chauvin filed for a new trial. What do you think will happen next? And also the social, the reaction to it. The criminal justice system is starting to turn in the direction that it should turn, uh, but it's still turning very slow. The truth is the federal government should have been yeah. the first to charge these killers. Uh, with the murder of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. It literally took a new Justice Department in order to see that reality mm -hmm. happen. And the constitutional violations are evident. 
the federal government could have been involved in all of these cases where there's a constitutional uh, deprivation of yeah. due process. Well, you don't get more of a slap in the face of due process than killing someone without the opportunity of due process. And so we see it happening now, wheels of justice turning in the right direction. Uh, but, you know, Chauvin wasn't the only person on trial. Really, the criminal justice system was on trial. And we have to now reimagine not only policing, but reimagine how we do stuff in the United States of America. It should not be this difficult to convict a cop or cops of murdering mm. a civilian. And there was a situation in Sacramento that just happened where a police officer has mm -hmm. now been charged with felonies for falsifying police reports in Sacramento. That's, this is a 26-year-old mm -hmm. um, cop. But we know that police officers do um, falsify police reports. It needs to now be the norm mm -hmm. to charge cops who do so. So, Rashad, two things. Uh, I just want to follow up on that. Do you think that we pay so much attention to police and police wrongdoing, rightfully so, that we seem to skip over the district attorneys who have so much power and mm. seem to charge a lot of people unless they're in uniform, right? Are, are we ignoring them and the relationship between DAs and police? I think you make a remarkable point, Sharon, and the short answer is yes. Uh, we have to put more emphasis on the prosecutors that are involved because the prosecutors have the positional authority to transform policy without creating new legislation or lobbying for new legislation. Let's go to Baltimore. Uh, Marilyn Mosby, mm. the state's attorney, she mm -hmm. changed their entire criminal justice system last year by refusing to prosecute um, crimes of survival, low offenses or misdemeanors, prostitution. She said, I'm no longer prosecuting these cases. Um, and her crime went down by double digits. Violent crime went down by double digits, 39% um, mm -hmm. down as far as incarceration because cops can now focus on real crimes. And that's what's happening. Even the reimagined policing or the defunding of police is to reprioritize the policing budget. But if we don't get DAs in place who are willing to hold the whole system accountable, uh, then we're going to have the same mm -hmm. old, same old. So I, I do think we need to have a razor sharp focus also on the district attorneys who are elected. Yeah, the whole justice system needs uh, revamping uh, from the district attorneys, uh, some of the lawyers, even some of the judges mm -hmm. that are out there as well yes. because they've been part of the problem for so many years. Uh, you are the voice. Uh, you, you could be the mayor of Atlanta. Uh, a lot of people respect your voice, uh, obviously, oh, right. because of what you've been right, able to right. do around the country. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, there's going to be an opening. Uh, you heard uh, everybody was kind of surprised by Keisha Lance Bottoms announcement last week that she was not going to seek reelection. Were you one of those people surprised? I wasn't surprised. Um, I've actually said on my radio show that I'm not sure if she would run for reelection. One year in, I had her on my program mm. and I asked her on live radio. I said, how do you feel about your one year so far? And she said on live radio, um, I don't like it. It's, a, it's more difficult mm. than I ever imagined. Uh, was her exact wow. quote. Uh, and she had also said this in front of small groups uh, that she doesn't know if she would run for re-election. So it did not come as a surprise for me. Uh, the timing came as a surprise because of what's happening around the violence and the increase of criminal violence in Atlanta. I thought they would have been a little more strategic about the timing. But if she would have stayed in any longer, uh, she would have raised a whole lot of money and, and knew that she was not actually going to run for mayor uh, so I think she decided after that $500 yeah. million came in her bank account, let's, let's go ahead and cut this off now and let people know what my intentions are. Yeah, and we'll mm -hmm. see what happens. There's, there's chattering that the former uh, mayor, uh, 59, Kasim Reed, may jump back in, a job he loved, Antonio Brown, city council. We have Felicia Moore, city council president. So we'll see what happens, Rashad. Real quick before we let you go. You can't, first of all, run for mayor because you wouldn't make as much money as you do now. And I happen to know you get paid a <laughs> lot of money, but you also do a lot of charity work. You were just handing out more cash and people who live in, in Metro Atlanta know this is what you do, just handing out cash to teachers. And so I want to know why that's so important to you. And I believe we have a, a couple of images. You know, Sharon, I was a foster kid and, you know, yeah. I went through many foster homes. Uh, one of the most impactful was a school teacher. Uh, she was uh, a middle school and high school teacher, taught me the value of education. That's why I have several advanced degrees, including two doctorates today. Uh, and so some days mm -hmm. I feel like just waking up, going to schools where school teachers are making a difference and handing everybody on staff, including uh, the janitorial staff, maintenance mm -hmm. staff and the cafeteria staff. I hand them mm -hmm. cash money, every single one of them. <laughs> and that's out of your pocket. So, Has there ever been know, journalists that's made a difference in your life? <laughs> I mean, like, I'm, I'm you, getting to the, 
Jackson 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 Jackson